Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the Colorado Workshop of the Working Lands, Working Communities Initiative. We had a wonderful day yesterday with a lot of wonderful presenters, and we're looking forward to more enlightening conversations today, starting with the Conservation Ranching Initiative of Audubon Rockies. But first, I wanted to remind everybody, um, for those of you watching remotely, you can submit questions to ask wga at westgov.org at any time, and we'll do our best to get those um, asked of the panel during the question and answer period. You can also watch all of these sessions again on WGA's YouTube channel or share them with friends or people you think would be interested. And um, for those of you who are here in the audience, please remember if you do ask a question to identify yourself before you begin. With that, I will turn it over to Dusty Downey and the National Audubon Society. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Well, first off, uh, we want to thank the WGA for allowing us the opportunity to come here and, and visit a little bit about this initiative. It's something that I think is very close to all of our hearts and, and something we believe in, in uh, a lot. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to be able to do that. Yesterday was a great round of panels. We heard a lot of great information, and so hopefully we can uh, uh, tag on to some of the, the talks that, were, that happened yesterday. So um, we're going to do just a little quick round of introductions, and then we'll jump into things. Again, my name is Dusty Downey. Uh, I uh, work with the Conservation Ranching Program, the Conservation Ranching Initiative with, in the National Audubon Society. Uh, I'm also a rancher up in northeast Wyoming. Uh, my family's been ranching up there since 1962. I've had the uh, you know, benefit of being able to live up there with my folks and, and my brother and sister-in-law, my beautiful wife and kids, and, and so we're, we're still on the ranch, able to do, um, live that ranching lifestyle, and so again, this initiative is, is very close to my heart. It, it means a lot to me, and so it's really exciting to be able to kind of uh, get that out there about what we're trying to do. So, Dallas, you want to do a quick intro? My name is Dallas May. I ranch in southeast Colorado. And I'm fortunate to do that with my family, my mother, my brother, my sister. Uh, all of our families are involved. I have three grown children. I have grandchildren. And I'm happy to say that all of them are actively involved in the ranch. We also have an irrigated farm, raised corn and alfalfa. Mm -hmm. But we focus, our passion is definitely the native grasslands and conservation that we can provide with those. So I'm really privileged, I think, that Western Governors Association for this opportunity. Good morning, I'm Adrienne LaRue with Corner Post Meats, based out of Black Forest, Colorado on a National Audubon Society ranch. Um, one of the initial ranches of the Conservation Ranching Program. Uh, my other half, Dan and I, um, own and operate Corner Post Meats where we are connecting consumers back to the land and where their food, excuse me, where their food comes from. And uh, so we believe that you have to eat it to support the land. Um, otherwise, you're just doing great things on the land and then it kind of goes into the oblivion. So it's really exciting to connect consumers back to, to what they eat. Uh, I'm Farley Green with the National Audubon Society. I am the marketing manager for the Audubon Conservation Ranching Initiative. And um, I'm pretty new with Audubon. I started at the end of June. Um, I have a unique background in the food industry, uh, mostly with restaurants and chefs, so um, I think I bring a different perspective for how we're going to connect consumers with our Audubon certified um, ranch, ranch conservation initiatives, and um, I'm excited about it. Great. And my name's Melinda Sepp. I work for National Audubon. I'm a vice president. I lead our working lands and natural climate solutions portfolio. So thankfully, that means I get to work with Dusty and the ACR team. Um, I'm actually a veterinarian by training, and I grew up on a small family farm on the eastern shore of Maryland. So I was really excited to come join Audubon, and in large part because of the program and the work that we're here to talk about today. And it is, just to echo what Dallas said, an awesome opportunity to be here to talk about. So really look forward to it. Great. Well, I always hear a picture is worth a thousand words, but I think a video is, is worth a million more. So I'm going to show a quick video here. The beauty, of this the beauty of this landscape to me is that we can come out and you can see for miles and miles in this green rolling hills. It's all native grass. There's no defects in it from the way it was intended to be, and that's what we truly want to be able to keep it as. I'm Riley May, uh, we're from Lamar, Colorado. My family and I farm and ranch here. Ranches like this 
um, in our area and probably the whole eastern plains are very scarce and they're more heavily infiltrated and developed each year it seems like and there's pressure for development all around us I mean everywhere we look. Our ranch is basically an island of grass in a sea of developed farmland. The reason I'm so passionate about protecting wildlife habitat because as I was young I watched all these places disappear. If it wasn't for cattle ranching these ranches would have been turned and converted into farmland decades ago because people that live in this area have to be able to provide for their families, they have to be able to make their payments, and if they cannot do that, they will be gone and the next person will come in and own that land and they will find the next way there is to make this land economically sustainable. While cattle ranching is the only thing that has kept ranches such as ours in their native pristine state. So thanks to conservation ranching through Audubon, it gives people like us who are trying to raise cattle humanely and as natural state as possible, gives us another opportunity to be able to do that. Audubon is, besides trying to do all natural grass-fed, humanely raised beef, Audubon is also trying to enhance wildlife habitat and especially enhance habitat for birds. It's obvious to anybody who's involved that if you have habitat that birds can thrive in, every other species of wildlife will thrive in that habitat. The conservation ranching program through Audubon has given us a tool that has missed from our toolbox for many years, and that is being able to have an organization that can reach out to people and consumers who really care about the same things that we care about. We would really like to just basically have everything the way you see it here today, all of this to be exactly the same as it is today in a hundred years so that my kids and my grandkids and their grandkids can all come out and appreciate this. And I want to be able to keep that going and I want to instill that in the next generation that we have to be able to understand the importance of what we're doing out here and what we have and we need to be good stewards of what we've been given. out there doing great jobs on easements and other things and as Audubon we decided to kind of you know try the market-based approach and so um, it has worked out pretty well it's a market-based value-added program and we feel it's pretty unique in the space um, it seeks to support and reward those ranchers because we all know they're the stewards and the managers of huge chunks of land as Leslie talked about yesterday those private landowners are a linchpin for all this habitat all the birds the wildlife that we're talking about 
Um, and they represent just such a huge chunk of that. And so we also wanted to engage consumers, though, and, and just the everyday person out there um, to empower them to, you know, basically take part in conservation through something as simple as, as buying bird-friendly beef. So we're there as Audubon, our wheelhouse, our lane, if you will, is are things like, you know, providing technical assistance, um, you know, talking about habitat, uh, scientific monitoring, and, and Audubon does that really, really well. Um, we also are helping on some of our ACR ranches to, to implement projects. We've got a Western Waters Initiative that is dealing with the, the water issues across the West, and they're, and they're doing a fabulous job of, of navigating all of, of that along with the agricultural community. So it's that partnership um, that's, that's there that's really important. But at the end of the day, that's not going to help the men and women who are on the ground pay their bills. And that is a, a really important part. And so we knew we needed to do more. So what we do is we take Audubon's logo, our brand, our backing, our, you know, basically the trust that the, the public has in our conservation organization and allow producers to use that and leverage that to, to be able to get into a marketplace. Um, it, it is definitely, uh, it's definitely fairly new, nuanced in certain ways. But we're very proud of the fact that, you know, our ranches that we certify, um, they follow protocols pertaining to things like environmental sustainability, animal welfare, um, habitat management. We work with those producers to, to make a habitat management plan for that ranch, so it is ranch by ranch level. Now it can be scaled up, but every ranch has this habitat management plan that helps outline the places where increasing Habitat can help a producer increase production as well. And so we find those overlaps, and then that's really the goals that we, that we go towards. So those habitat management plans are, are crucial to this. And then at the end of the day, this is all third-party audited. So what you hear and what you see is, is what you get. There are a lot of certifications out there. Um, there's a lot of information out there that, it, I mean, to be frank about it, really isn't worth the paper they're printed on, okay? You hear a lot of big conglomerations, greenwashing things. Audubon wanted to do it right and wanted to have the science and wanted to have the backing and really wanted to continue to get the trust that we have from the people that we represent across the nation. And so we're, we're pretty proud of that. We're proud of the fact that this third party verification, it truly means something and, it, and it's audited and it can be verifiable, which is, which is a huge part of this. So, um, you know, we know that this is the primary tool that we can use as Audubon to help preserve and protect those grasslands. This is a way for us to be in that space and really make a difference when it comes to the birds. So we're excited about that. Um, we're not here to tell anybody to eat meat or to not eat meat. We're here to say whatever you choose, choose wisely. Choose the right thing. You know, do the research, go out there, make sure what you're eating has some sort of an impact. And we feel if your passion is you want it to have an impact on the conservation of birds, Audubon's here for you, okay? So make the right choices, that's really important for us. Um, you know, the bird-friendly beef that's out there, buy it if you can, um, it's Audubon certified. We know that protecting ranches and the bird habitat that they represent, it'll ultimately in the long run help the birds thrive, but it'll also help our ranching communities to prosper, and that's really, really important to us. So. That's kind of a little overview. Um, I think we're just gonna kind of do a round robin here. We're gonna ask some questions. We'll open it up at the end for folks to kind of, you know, ask questions of us, whether out in video land or, or the folks here. And so, um, well, Dallas, since we put you on the spot, we got you up there on the, on the video right away. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we start there with you? So, um, you know, one of the things you mentioned is, is your family on the ranch and, and uh, you know, you've got a wonderful family, you've got that, that group of people that are, that are there. Um, this year, you were a Stewardship Award winner, Leopold Stewardship, your ranch was. Um, you know, why, why is conservation something that you're so passionate about and, and what led you to that road to, to doing what you're doing? Um, 
My story is a little bit different than a lot of them that you hear in this realm. I am, or my family is fifth generation. We have ranched and farmed in southeast Colorado since the turn of the century. But we're unique in the fact that uh, we didn't inherit land. I didn't inherit land. Um, my great grandfather actually lost his place in the Depression. That began a series of rented farmland, sharecropping, renting grassland to be able to survive. And the ranch that we're currently on today, we actually were able to lease in 1980. The family we leased it from had the same philosophy as we did. Um, we, we worked under that until 2012. We had the opportunity to buy that ranch. It was extremely difficult, uh, nearly impossible for us to do, but we finally did get leveraged enough that we could buy it. The reason I mention that is Every decision we make is not an experiment. Every decision we make goes directly to, are we going to be able to make our mortgage payments? So nothing's a, an experiment with us. Everything has to work. Um, 30 years ago, I started working with grass-fed beef companies. I've, I've worked with a lot of them. I've actually sold a lot of grass-fed beef before Audubon was in this. And Audubon is uniquely positioned to be able to reach across the urban-rural divide. Because Audubon, if you really stop and think about who do you imagine when you think of Audubon society? You think of people who live in urban areas that want to, that care about birds and are passionate about it, but you don't think of a connection with them and the actual ranching community. Well, credit to the Audubon society, they did see that and they brought it together and one thing I'm always amazed of is there are Audubon people in everything that I work with. Um, you'll notice yesterday on one of the panels, Sarah Greenberger and Nada, they were both on the panel. They're Audubon. I mean, they have their roots in Audubon. And as you see up here today, there are so many people who are passionate about this that that's what sets Audubon apart from other grass-fed beef companies. The problem we have is we have so much competition, but there is so much disingenuous information out there. If you'll go to your local grocery store in my local community, what you'll find in the meat counter labeled as grass-fed beef is actually from New Zealand. And they have no protocol in place like we do. They can bring that beef into the United States in boxes, cut it up here, and label it as a product of the United States. So what Audubon is able to do, and I commend them for this, they follow those cattle their entire lifetimes those cattle are actually benefiting the environment that they're raised in. Um, most people have a misconception that cattle ranching is bad for the environment. They think that cattle ranching is bad for wildlife. Nothing could be further from the truth. The environment needs cattle since bison are gone. The environment needs ungulates grazing the grass. The grass reacts to grazing. That makes a healthier system. So. University of California in 2015 finally recognized, Audubon recognized it many years ago, that working lands, which is what we're talking about here today, need cattle grazing. It, we have on the ranch two pastures that um, many years ago, I was proud of the fact that we have never put cattle in those pastures. We keep them as wildlife habitat. I thought I was doing a great thing by doing that. Well, what I've realized over the past many years, that's the poorest grass we have on the ranch. That grass does not regenerate itself. No new species are started. So I have a direct experiment as to what cattle grazing does for rent, for the environment, and it's a huge benefit. So that's a long answer to a short oh, no. question, that was Dustin. Perfect. <laughs> that was perfect. Well, along, so along those lines, Dallas, I'd be interested to, to know, you know, I've been to the ranch, looked around a little bit, but it, I mean, if you had a group of people that came out to the ranch today and said, you know, we've, we've been told for years that cattle ranching is bad and, you know, these are all, what would you show them on your ranch? What would, what would be your, your highlight that you would take a group to? Say maybe it's this, this group of folks here or somebody out there. What would be your highlight you would want to show them? I think the thing that would have the most impact is I, I would want you to be there early in the morning and we'd go out into the middle of what you would consider a vast expanse of wasteland, a barren environment, and you would begin to grasp the concept of the multiple species that are out there. As far as, we're talking about birds. 
there are so many species of birds that have to have short grass prairie. They have to get away from shrubs, they have to get away from tall vegetation, and those are the birds that are the most endangered in the environment. But um, as far as number of species goes, once you get on the landscape and start to see that, then I think people start to grasp that, what the importance of short grass prairie is to the entire environment. What, uh, what, what practices do you do on the ranch to promote diversity of the birds? What sorts of things do you, do you folks do as managers to promote that diversity? Um, we always have operated in as natural state as we can. We do not, we don't alter nature. Nature does not have any waste. Everything in nature is either recycled or reused. It goes back into nutrients. So we try to do biomimicry. If there's something that works in nature, we try to do that in our cattle operation. Um, <clears throat> we, we do not, we've never killed an animal intentionally on our ranch. We don't shoot coyotes, we don't kill prairie dogs, we don't kill rattlesnakes. We don't affect the environment in any way in our way, in our, our process. So because of that, for 40 years, we've had tens of thousands of calves born on the ranch. I can honestly tell you we have never lost a calf to predation. Never. Not one in tens of thousands. I have neighbors, and this isn't a criticism, that continually try to control coyotes. They're, they're constantly thinking coyotes are their enemies. They have constant predation problems. But what happens is because nature takes care of itself and nature abhors a vacuum, if coyotes are killed on a ranch, more coyotes are going to move in. They're migrants. They're going to come in. And when they come in, they don't have any concept of the social environment. First thing they do is start killing calves because they have to survive. If they're left alone, as we try to do it on the ranch, there's natural prey. I mean, we have prey dogs, we have all kinds of rodents, we have everything that is needed, and it sustains itself. So as far as trying to, to operate the ranch in a natural way, um, one, one thing that has been shown, and this is a hard thing to believe, in California, most grasslands are less than 1% native plants. Most grasslands are invaded by invasive plants that came in from the Mediterranean region. So today that's the environment. On the ranch we're on, we had, um, through a partnership with the Denver Botanical Gardens for several years, they came and did surveys because they're trying to answer some of these questions. And on our ranch, after years of studying it, the plants on the ranch are 85% native. The only non-native plants on the ranch are on two public roads that go through the ranch. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that we bring it to a more natural state. And in doing that, we were able a few years ago to begin a carbon credit offset program. And so we have so many third-party verifications that all of them point us towards one goal, and that's keeping that ranch in a natural state so that we have biodiversity in all things, and I think that's the key to success. I don't know. I may be here a year from now or maybe talking to somebody a year from now, and we couldn't sustain it economically, so somebody else would be trying to do it. But we did place a conservation easement on our ranch, so whether, whether we have it or somebody else has it, that ranch is never going to be destroyed. It's never going to be plowed up. It's never going to be developed. So hopefully, you know, there, there are places like that all over the West, and I think that's the key to success. Great. Adrian, let's move on to you. <laughs> so Adrian, uh, you know, you're, you're a rancher by trade. You've, you've ranched across the West. Um, I think I'd put you into the category of being an entrepreneur as well. Um, you have done a really good job with your, your meat company, Corner Post Meats. Um, and, you know, I've always enjoyed the fact that you're very candid about things. And so you see some interesting things on your website like, uh, you know, meat for people who give a damn. And uh, lots of really great little one-liners that, that really do, they say something. What, what do you want to say? Elaborate on that a little bit. Um, so we've got that great, you know, little, little one-liner there, but, but what does that mean in the long run? So to you, the meat for people to give a damn. So I think that there's this um, checklist a lot of us have in our heads when, uh, when we cross this threshold of giving a damn, so to speak. And uh, okay, it's gotta be good for the environment and good for my health and good for communities and, good for wildlife and 
and all these things that, that we want to see. And then we go and can potentially get greenwashed, kind of like what Dallas was talking about. And so we decided instead of going through that super long list, like that was the, the giving a damn was the first, was the first step. Whether it's, it's opening your eyes, it is, um, it's thinking one step further. It's not just, um, you know, what's, what's convenient, what's a, what's a habit, what is, what's nearby. It's that, what is this next step that I'm going to take? Because ultimately we believe that your food dollar can have a conservation value. And so that, that's what's exciting for us is to connect with others who give a damn because ultimately like like Dallas was talking about like as ranchers we have this ultimate care <laughs> for for the animals that are that are under our our care and protection and for the land that um, that we that we steward and our communities that we are part of and and the millions of heartbeats that are kind of second nature for us to think about like the birds the rabbits, the, um, the bees, the elk, you know, all of them, is that all of those factor into our decisions on the ranch. And so, um, yeah, so for, for us, it was just about kind of how do we look at that, that one line of uh, I'm going to be more intentional and I'm going to be more mindful about how I spend my money so that then my food dollar has a, a conservation value. Um, I can get so chatty about that, but I think maybe I'll, I'll pause, I'll take it, I'll take a long breath. And if there's something that you want to go more specific into. No, I think that's great. We may get some questions later on from the, from, from the group. And, and so we can definitely elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, one of the, one of the things that, that you do really well with corner post and, and you and Dan do really well, um, is, is the business side of it. Now, the business side of me, what, what are your challenges? You've got a big audience here that is, you know, everything from the governors all the way down. This is, you know, you've got a, a really interesting audience here. What are your challenges to being able to make that product get to where it needs to be that maybe there's some folks don't, wouldn't know about, don't understand? So when you think about corner post meats, there's there's the two sides. There's the the ranching enterprise, which is you know actually raising the animals, caring for the land, um, you know, like I was saying, factoring in how that impacts the the wildlife and our livestock and our ecology. Like there's all of those pieces. Then there's the flip side, which is the meats business side, which is taking that amazing product that we have raised off the land and then getting it to your kitchen at home um, so that you don't have to be in southeastern Colorado or out on grasslands in order to support the amazing work that American ranchers are doing. And so there is a long laundry list on both sides. Um, on on the, the ranching enterprise side, I think uh, there there is the urban rural divide, which in some ways is getting better and there's more crossover now than there has ever been in the past. And in other ways, there are more like, you stay over there and I stay over here. Um, but I think this, this awareness and this um, sharing of why it matters and how we can support each other um, is, is one of the biggest opportunities and challenges there. Um, and really being how to be neighborly um, even if your neighbor is, is many miles away or just within the state of Colorado or within the Rockies. Um, on the flip side, on the meats business side, um, like I said in my intro, you know, ultimately we believe that you have to eat it in order to, to support it. Like if you just feel it in your, in your heart and believe in it, that does not help Dallas pay his mortgage. Um, ultimately, it comes from his ability to sell animals um, and that's, that's how he makes his living. Um, and we are, we are no different. We just happen to sell them to ourselves as our meats business. Um, and so whether it's, uh, you know, processing infrastructure, cold storage, um, you know, all, all of that, like the, the infrastructure essentially goes against small scale business, um, and does not necessarily support knowing where your food comes from. Uh, 
and knowing those who, who raised it. And I think that there's the pandemic opened up a lot of opportunities through that because we saw how fragile our um, large scale food system is and how resilient we could be in a more regional based system. Um, but it is not one or the other, it's, it's how to, to support on, on both sides. And ultimately, I believe that from a customer base, like that's how you, you push change instead of trying to pull everyone into the market. Um, and again, through the pandemic, we've seen that's how, you know, lots of small meats businesses have popped up um, trying to serve that need uh, and that growing awareness of, of the support that people can have. Again, your food dollar can have a conservation value. And so why not spread that as far and wide as you can to impact um, as many as many businesses and acres and animals and, and wildlife as possible. And that's what Audubon is trying to do, connect people to, to where their food comes from and the, the conservation value it can have on the land. Great. And then just as a as kind of a softball question, I talked to you, Dallas, about it. Well, I mean, if you had this group of people, what would you show them on the ranch? If you had a group of people that were either skeptical or maybe, I mean, what would be the highlights on, on the ranch that you would like to show folks? Yeah, so I think um, tying into uh, a lot of the kind of fire mitigation and forest management conversations that there were yesterday, um, like I said, we're in the Black Forest. So the Black Forest fire came through the ranch in 2013. Um, devastated the community and it has been our responsibility to now manage that land to recover from that and use livestock as a tool for that and then manage the land in a way that helps protect our neighbors homes because um, there will be another fire it's not if it happens it is when it happens and so I think I would show you the timber management that we're doing and then how we are using livestock as a tool to to recover from that and then feed you an amazing meal <laughs> and uh and then we'd probably swing by we've got uh we've got some sows having piglets in the forest right now which is always pretty cool to see like newborn baby piglets like already rooting um because they're not on concrete slabs in inside of a building they're outside in nature and how resilient their immune systems are. Um, and then what that means like for my immune system when I eat that pork chop in a year. Uh, so I think that's probably what I would, uh, I would show and then swing by the cows on, on the way out, on the way out the gate. <laughs> Perfect, sounds great. All right, so Farley. Uh, Farley and I had the, the, the chance to, to sit together in a car for, for many, many hours on a tour to Montana and a, and a little bit of Wyoming. Um, as she said, relative, as you said, you're relatively new to the program. Um, I, I'm a little curious of how you got here to the program and, and kind of what, what, what really drew you to it and, and with your background, why was it interesting to you? So I spent most of my career in restaurants, um, and <clears throat> that's a hard business, as I think people are starting to understand with the Me Too movement. Um, but I've always been passionate about food and where food comes from. And so when the pandemic happened, um, I got laid off, and I decided I wanted to learn more about the agricultural side of food. So I actually went to work on a farm, <laughs> and. Um, it opened my eyes to how hard it is to be in sort of the farming and ranching community and how to make a living doing that and we can't survive without that. Uh, so it became really important to me to find a job where I was helping to make a difference, um, to use my marketing background to empower consumers to be part of the solution. Um, and that is how I sort of found this program um, and it was about a year and a half until I actually got the job because of the pandemic and Audubon is very diligent um, in the interview process. So <laughs> I feel good that I, got, I made it and I'm really excited. We have some really cool things um, I think coming down the pipeline for this program. 
Yeah, I think. I mean, I think since the beginning we've talked about it. I mean, the the marketing has been a piece of this puzzle that we've always needed and just didn't know how to put together. And with you here now, I mean, I think this is a really, really great time to to kind of finally put all these pieces together. And so, I mean, what do you see as as maybe some opportunities for the next year or two that that you look forward to that that really could move this forward? Yeah. So there's been a lot of talk about connecting rural and urban communities and how they sort of don't understand each other, I guess is a good way to put it. Um, I lived in New York City for 10 years, and I live in California, uh, Napa, so I'm living among a monoculture of vines, but still more farming than in New York City. Um, and I think that's something that, because the general public trusts the Audubon name, we have the opportunity to leverage that and have urban people tell the stories of these ranchers who are really conservationists. Um, they're not they're not contributing to the problem, actually. They're part of the solution. And really educating consumers somewhere like New York, they can't relate to being on a ranch in Colorado. Um, tell those stories, uh, show up at events, and you know, partner with chefs, and do these things that are sort of outside of the box, as far as Audubon is concerned. I mean, that's not where Audubon normally sits, right, at some food and wine festival. Um, so I, I think we have some really cool things that we can do um, and highlight our ranchers as conservationists because that's what they're doing. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. I mean, I think it really is always gonna come back down to, to you guys, to us, to, to the ranching community and, and really highlighting and, and educating on what really happens on a ranch and what really happens for those of us who believe in conservation. And so I think that's a, that's a great point. It's always gonna come back to that. And that's always what's gonna speak to the rest of you know everybody else out there, whether they be consumers or you know any any other end of it. So, uh, Melinda, welcome. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you you know you've served as as senior advisor and and deputy chief of staff at the USDA. I mean, you have got a very strong background in in policy. Um, but your, your, it seems like your portfolio has included the working lands and climate solutions. So where does the conservation ranching program kind of fit into that component of it, of your portfolio there? Yeah, um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, and I'm just having a flashback to a conversation Dallas and I were having a little before the panel. And, um, I'm going to try to not get quite as excited as I was earlier, but you know, there's this laundry list, right? Like if you, if you spend time in the places that we're talking about, um, it's really easy if you're driving by to just think, I think Dallas, you described them kind of right as like a barren wasteland. And if you're zooming by, it can look that way. But when you stand there and think about everything that that working land is doing, right? Like they, there's how much carbon already there. They can store more if you work to enhance um, and restore some of the degraded grasslands that we have. They're actively filtering water, water that makes it into streams, rivers, downstream drinking water. They're purifying air. They're a critical habitat for a host of animals, right? Like the biodiversity in those ecosystems is just pretty powerful. Um, frankly, just when you're standing there for, and just standing still and listening for a little while, right? They are working lands. And sometimes it's helpful to just kind of stop and remind all of us, right? Like they are actively working. You might not see it in the same way that you do in other places, but that land is actively working for us in ways that we can take for granted, especially if you're removed from it or it just looks different than where, you're, where, you, where you grew up or what you're used to seeing. Um, so with my Audubon hat on, in addition to all of that, they're just, frankly, imperative ecosystems for birds. Um, Dusty talked a bit at the top of the panel about birds and bird populations, and the grassland birds in particular, it's just really staggering. Uh, some of the literature shows roughly a 53% decrease in grassland bird populations since 1970. So even, you know, birds generally not doing well, significant declines, grassland birds kind of the worst um, cohort among them. And Part of ACR is this, you know, I, I like to think about, with my Audubon hat on this, we're working with a toolbox, like a whole toolkit of how do we protect and conserve grasslands in the US. And a big part of that is the conservation ranching portfolio that we've been here talking about. It's not the only part, but it's a pretty critical part. And it's what sets Audubon apart in my mind 
because it is a market-based program. It's how do we have durable public policies that support grassland conservation and partner that with durable market signals that support grassland conservation? Because that connection is what it's going to take for this to be long-term, right? Like thinking about the video at the top of the call, thinking about Dallas and his family and you know grandkids in that video, and we want them to be able to be there and to have you know, sound financial ability to pay their mortgage or maybe not pay a mortgage by then, maybe just, you know, be successful members of their community. And all of this contributes both to like, coming back to the working lands and working uh, communities initiative, right? It's grasslands are working lands and they're a critical part of the working communities and the rural economies and places. Great. No. Um, so what what where do you see um, things like the farm bill and other conservation programs like that kind of where do they fit in with this and why are they important in the overall scheme of things yeah uh i'm gonna i'm trying not to use a ton of numbers but i'm gonna use one and then i'm gonna move on and uh <laughs> and you know if you just before we do any level of detail here about farm bill generally but just farm bill conservation programs we are spending an average of six billion, B with billion, dollars on farm bill conservation programs. It kind of on average a year since, you know, the 2010, 2011, I think. And that's kind of predicted to continue. So one, that's a decent investment, right? And in, in private voluntary conservation. And two, that is six billion dollars that is going out into kind of local economies, right? Like that is paying for work to be done, that is paying for conservation planning, that's paying for conservation technical assistance. Hopefully it's also helping folks think about um, implementing practices that they may not have otherwise been able to do and also still being able to pay the mortgage, right? Like this kind of all comes back to this has to make sense financially, like Dallas mentioned at um, the top of the panel. And those programs support practices, right? And the scale of the investment is just like, we can't, I personally think like, you can't just kind of pretend it's not there. And that's on top of all of these really great state programs and state investments, right? Like when we think just about the footprint of the Western governors, like each state is also working on its own programs and policies in addition to those federal ones. Um, so I think just kind of coming back to something I said earlier, you know, there's this really complicated marketplace out there. We're talking, Adrienne and Dallas have both talked about what their landscapes look like. And implementing all of those conservation practices, it takes like financial and technical resources. The Farm Bill programs are a really important part of making sure that we can reduce barriers to those practices in the field and at scale. But they're certainly not the only part, which is why Audubon has the conservation ranching program. And I think you've kind of covered this, but I think it's worth still still going over again and, and kind of reiterating some of this. But can you can you connect the dots again? How does this program and really support Audubon's mission, um, and how does that connect back to the working lands? Yeah, sure thing. Um, you know that video is a really great example from the top end. So Audubon is working on this right because Audubon's mission is to protect birds in the places they need today and tomorrow. Grasslands are a really important part of that. You know, 53% of grassland birds lost since 1970. A lot of work to be done. And that's both bird abundance and also bird diversity on, on individual ranches. And I think you know, Dallas and Adrian both have really awesome stories, and they're just two of the folks we work with. Um, also, just really mindful that those are, those are individual stories, but coming back to something Farley talked about on the marketing side, those stories and that narrative is what we can help connect for consumers, right? Like when you're in a grocery store and there's, you know, I'll admit I spend a lot of time when I'm shopping because I like to read the labels and then read about them later and think about what they actually maybe mean, um, <laughs> which is why I'm sure I'm really fun to grocery shop with. <laughs> but, you know, it's a crowded marketplace there and how can we help tell a story that is different and authentic and true to the work that's happening and connecting it both to biodiversity and for us birds and also climate, right? Um, there's this entire, you know, there's just so much that's happening here and how can we tell that in a way that is motivating and empowering for consumers to then invest, kind of to Adrian's point, like invest in the products that support a conservation vision. Okay. Well, I think we've, we've kind of got our pieces. Is there anything else burningly that anybody wants to say before we kind of open it up to, to start thinking about questions and, and see if anybody out there in video land has anything? I think just to like 
finalize, you did a fantastic job of explaining that. I think that the thing that always dawns on me is if Dallas isn't on that land, who is and what is happening to it? And that's ultimately, I think, where it ties back to that working lands piece and why the conservation matters and supporting the conservation matters is that if it's a Bed Bath & Beyond parking lot, that's a really crappy place to be a bird or any other animal <laughs> person, anything, you know? Like, so, so that, like, there's no going back from that standpoint. And then if, and you talked about this um, in the video, but if, uh, if, you, if you sell out the ranch to a developer and now it's, you know, five acre ranchettes, that's like kind of a mediocre place to be wildlife. Not as bad as the Bed Bath & Beyond parking lot, but still not great. Um, or if, if it turns into row cropping, then, you know, again, you're kind of on a downhill slide. And so I think that is um, remembering why ranchers who give a damn on the land is, is a great thing um, because they, they really are trying to do the best for the land, which in turn is best for kind of the, the wider community. Yeah, we always say we want to keep ranchers ranching because without ranchers, we don't have grasslands. Dusty, I might, I just wanted to mention this. I'm sure everybody in the room, everybody listening is aware. Um, two weeks ago, U.S. Fish and Wildlife announced 23 species that have been declared extinct. Birds, birds. Species. In our lifetime. And if that doesn't resonate with you, I don't know what it takes. One short example is the ranch we're on um, was in high threat of being developed. We have approximately 5,000 acres of emergent wetlands. We have seven miles of stream bed at, with a white valley that is an alluvial aquifer. It, it purifies water, it stores water underground, returns that water to the river in a clean state. It lags it to the river. It doesn't come across the top of the ground, it comes underneath. But in the process of this, it wasn't even realized till a few years ago with us, there we have five threatened species that have been identified on the ranch. All five of them are under threat of being on the next extinction list. One of those that wasn't even recognized is a bird called the Eastern Black Rail. The Eastern Black Rail is basically from the Eastern United States, but there are small populations that came into the Midwest, naturally, and they're secretive marsh birds. Most bird people have never even seen an Eastern Black Rail. They actually can be credited with, put it on their list if they hear one. So we have miles of eastern black rail habitat that had we not been able to get this ranch secured, that it was going to be developed. The water out of the wetlands, we have seven high capacity irrigation wells that are adjudicated by the state of Colorado in these wetlands that in the past had been pumped. In 40 years since we've been on it, they have not been pumped. The marshlands have all returned and the emergent wetlands are in place. We have beaver dams that are holding water underground to purify it and send it into the river. Now, if modern technology had its way, a lot of the political environment today is instead of that stream being a meandering stream with wetlands underneath the ground, it would be an incised stream channel that would as quickly as possible drain water into the river. And now the problem that Colorado and Kansas are having is water quality. That very thing has happened on some streams and water is simply flushing into the river, carrying all of its contaminants with it. Whereas a stream with beaver dams, storing that water underground, slowly returning that water to the river in a methodical way is purifying the water. So what I'm trying to say is all of these things would have been lost on our ranch and in thousands of other ranches across the West if it wasn't for help from organizations like the National Audubon Society and a whole host of others, and the group of people who are listening to this have the, have the opportunity to impact that and keep these working lands in, in use, keep rural communities viable. Um, Jim spoke yesterday about logging and the, the amount of turnover that that dollar has in a community. The same thing holds true for our community and cattle ranching. If it wasn't for cattle ranching, the prosperity would leave our country. We're under threat right now of buy and drive water developers, hedge funds, foreign hedge funds are buying land, drying the water up off that land, selling that water to the municipalities, 
taking the prosperity out of that country. The municipalities need the water, but there's a way to get it without drying the land up permanently, and that's Colorado's Water Plan, which is a leasing sharing program that young farmers and ranchers can participate in, and the water stays attached to the land, but as a series of years, the water portions of it can be moved to the city. So there are answers out there, and this group and this audience has the ability to affect those changes. Great. And just to be clear, that's not an open invitation for anybody to go running out there to get the black rails on their list. So. <laughs> <laughs> if you're One. interested, give me a call. Don't go bother <laughs> Dallas because, you know, we, we know how crazy all of us birders are. So, <laughs> we, One thing I didn't mention, our ranch is mostly we have two public roads go through it. 80% um, of the ranch is behind locked gates, and it's that way for a purpose, to protect the habitat. Okay. All right. I think we're going to turn it over and see if there's some questions from the audience. Um, yeah, we do have, uh, and this one I think is for all of you, um, and it's from Margaret McRoberts with uh, Stella Sustainability. Try saying that five times fast. Um, <laughs> the and there's a couple of different questions in here. Um, one of them is, you guys are really lucky. It, it, we talked a lot yesterday about markets and uh, the challenges with finding markets for low-grade bi biomass. You guys are lucky. You're turning your low-grade biomass into steaks and pork chops and pretty good deal. <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean that you don't have challenges with establishing viable marketplaces for that product and and all the marketing and, and effort that goes into that. Can you talk a little bit um, just a, in more detail about the challenges you have with establishing those marketplaces and, and making them sustainable for, for your products? You want to take that one or you want me to? You take it. All right. So, yeah, there's a lot of pieces to that. Um, but ultimately, in order for me to have a steak or a pork chop to sell, it comes from you know, the animal on the land. I have to haul it to a USDA certified processor to then get frozen packages of meat, put it on a refrigerated transportation in order to take it to a cold storage facility to then have a product to turn around and, and sell. And then there's the, the transportation and the pieces within that. So whether it's, you know, when we use pre-pandemic, we worked a lot with um, front range chefs. And so whether it's getting that then on a distributor's truck and whether or not the distributor is there on time and can you offer the same kind of terms that Cisco can and, you know, I mean, like it can get uh, in the entrepreneurial world, it can get very, very nuanced when you're dealing with a commodity product that you're trying to sell not as a commodity because you don't want to compete with kind of this race to the cheapest price option that kind of takes prisoners the entire, every single step of the way. You know, you're, you're trying to break free from that. Um, so, none of those um, steps throughout that process are very supportive of small, small to medium-sized businesses. Um, they are highly um, regulated, low-margin businesses. So you're trying to do business with the best USDA processor that you can that might not be anywhere near you or you know they have their own issues with running their business and then you're trying to do business with the best cold chain transportation that you can who have their own issues and then you're trying to do business with you know the the one cold storage warehouse in Colorado Springs one, you know, <laughs> and so, so there's kind of all of those pieces and that's just for me to have a product then to turn around and sell and say, oh, by the way, it's, you know, X percent over what you're accustomed to. Will your customer um, pay that price or, or will your family absorb that in their budget? And, and so it becomes a, a lot of layers to go through 
And that's like once it's in a package, much less once you start with like, oh, we took a life in order to now nourish you. Um, which I think ties to what Dusty was saying earlier of, you know, there's a lot of people who've decided I'm not gonna go down that route because I feel like not eating meat is better for the environment. Um, and that's, you know, part of what the connection that we're trying to make is that actually we're dispelling that, but that honoring an animal's life and nourishing yourself is, is actually the, the best way to, to honor it and, and, and utilize all of the pieces from that animal instead of you know just taking steaks and ground beef and composting the rest or throwing it away or whatever. So that in itself could be its own panel to go through. <laughs> but. Well, and you, you walked straight into Margaret's second question, which is <laughs> what can you, what could be done to, to help establish and, and create that additional infrastructure, create, establish more small uh, and regional uh, meat processing facilities. So are there, what can you, what could be done in that space? So I think in the state of Colorado, it's amazing to see what the beer industry has done and what the cannabis industry has done. Whether you agree with either of them, I think both of those have been market driven and consumer driven. And then that has helped fill in a lot of the infrastructure um, kind of as a secondary piece. As, as an early adopter in a business, it's very difficult because you're trying to operate without all of that infrastructure. But now if you look at like CSU has a fermentation institute and they, they have a, a brewer's degree um, and that wouldn't have happened without having businesses that, um, that came in and started brewing beer and then a lot of happy consumers who then have supported more and more breweries. And so um, that is my hope within the direct market meats business is that because of overwhelming consumer support for mindful products, that then that helps um, justify the investment in that. And then I think that's where those who are savvier at, at policy and, and things like that can help from the government support. You know, my sweet spot and expertise is definitely on the, the market side and far less on the, um, the government and policy side. But, but that's what I see as imperative in order to, to head in that direction. Do you have anything to add from the marketing side? No, I think from the marketing side, it's just gonna be a lot about education because people don't understand where their food comes and so we have to teach them. Can you talk a little bit about, so when you, when you come up with a, a marketing plan and, mm -hmm. and and the branding of the of that product if if i'm a rancher and am interested in in getting involved with something like this just, can you talk through the challenges associated with working with people to actually get this on on store shelves or in restaurants and and how that whole dynamic works well, I think, I think we're talking about probably two different components of it. So there's the initial certification process, right? And, and that is where we've got folks that reach out to, to me or to Audubon and say, hey, look, I think, you know, I'm, I'm interested in this program. What are, what are some ways I can get involved? And so we provide the information on that. I sit down, we talk through the protocols and the practices to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, we talk about how the auditing process works, how the monitoring process works, because again, the science is very important to us as Audubon. And so, you know, we, we go through that whole process. Um, we do start to steer them down the road of connecting through some of the branded programs that we currently work with. 
Um, and you know that's where you start to see that spider web of the the market starting to take place. Is all right. We've got this ranch, and this is the this is what they have available. And where can that go? Who's the closest branded retailer? And and things like that. And so um, it's it's definitely not necessarily in Audubon's wheelhouse to do that. Um, but we do try to connect those dots. We do try to put those folks together and find that overlap. Um, you know, and, and again, I think that's what's what's really exciting about where we're at right now is, I mean, we're, we're really at this great, you know, tipping point of the program where it's, it's a big program now. I mean, we've got, you know, 139 ranches that are either certified or going through the process. Those ranches represent, you know, two and a half to three million acres of, of land. Um, that's a lot of animals that are that are out there for for the consumer, for that consumption. And so it's a matter of connecting the dots of who has what and who needs what. You know, it's the best win in the world for me when, you know, we can have, you know, somebody from Wyoming that feels comfortable calling Dan and Adrian at Corner Post and saying, hey, you know, I mean, I'm an Audubon certified. I've got, you know, X number of animals. You guys are doing some great finishing. Your product is amazing. I want to work with you. Can I sell them to you? You know, and 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 sometimes the answer is no. <laughs> you know, there's 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 not. Sorry, we would like to, but we can't. But but that that creating that network within that ranching community, I think, is is kind of another piece that that gets overlooked with this a little bit. Is you know, we've got a landowner down in in Nevada that runs a very large ranch down there, and that manager has the opportunity to call a land manager in Wyoming who also runs a very large tract of land. And so they've got these commonalities and Audubon, you know, we just kind of set that network up and now they, they call and talk to each other, right? And so that network is really what's gonna get back. And maybe this is kind of back to Margaret's, you know, question a little bit earlier is, there's lots of models to make this work, but it really comes down to those relationships and that network building. Um, you know, sometimes it's the cooperative model, like the Rocky Mountain High Plains Food Collaborative, or maybe it's, you know, something else. Each region may be a little bit different, but, but there's definitely answers there. There's definitely ways to do it, and I think the more, you know, great heads we get together, I think the easier it's going to become in the future, so. I've got one, and I just, <laughs> I want to go after, or, or suck Melinda's brain a little bit, just because you've got so much great experience across things. When, if, as we look forward to the next farm bill, and, and items that the governor's would look at to try to push things in a positive direction. What kind of what kind of things, either in under conservation programs or or uh, under RD, yeah. that would both help a rancher who's trying to do good things on the land, but also uh, help build that infrastructure that's needed to make this to make this this effort work yeah just a small question <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um what i'll maybe what i'll do is just try to like walk through a couple of the themes kind of quickly and then i'm gonna i'm gonna take my audubon hat off for just half a second and put on my some of my previous ones um you know the farm bill is huge right like 2023 every September 2023, I'm going right fall. Um, a lot of work to be done between now and then, a lot of work that's already started, more definitely to come. But also there's an annual appropriation cycle at the federal level, and I, I'm really mindful that sometimes there are these really interesting kind of research questions that folks have that could be supported through that annual appropriation cycle to help build towards an informed farm bill. So I would just, in addition to being like farm bill centered, I would just say like, you know, the annual approach process is pretty important too. Um, and we were both authorizers though, so it's. Uh, yeah, I, uh, well, I, my first job on the Hill wasn't an, well, my second job on the Hill wasn't an approach personal office. So I, you know, give my, spread the love around. But, um, but yeah, that's exactly it. It's, you know, the authorizing piece is so big. That's um, thinking about the title, like the conservation programs I would say there's some really interesting questions that folks are thinking through now, including, you know, are there some lessons learned from some of the state projects and programs that folks think if you, you know, sometimes 
my experience is sometimes we can all get so busy implementing the programs and projects that we don't have the bandwidth or the time to take that just like moment pause and say, wait, what have we learned from this? Who would that be good to share with? And are there some recommendations that could come out of it, right? You know, something that works really well in one part of the country might not work so well in another. And part of what I think is a real value add or just a selling point of those farm bill programs is those conservation programs are all national programs with really flexible kind of local implementation. And that's great. So what are some of the lessons learned to help improve that flexibility for program implementation? And is that, you know, in some of those longstanding programs, you've seen some initiatives under them of like, well, should we be thinking about wildlife habitat in this way? Should we be thinking about the set aside happening at this time of the year instead of at this time? Because, you know, just as simple as when an enrollment period is open is actually really important, right? But it's easy to get so focused on you know, one big top line thing that, that those, like those kind of nuts and bolts mechanics, we still have to remember to spend time on and think about. Um, beyond the conservation program, I would, I would just, conservation programs, I would come back to a few. One, the extension service, right? Like the U.S. has the gold standard extension service globally, right? Like I've, I've talked with folks in other places who have like come to visit to learn about our extension service. It's remarkably successful. But it looks a lot different now than it did even when I was a kid growing up, right? Like there used to be, when I was growing up, we had, an, we had a full-time staffer at our extension office plus someone who was helping manage the 4-H program. That's not the case in my home county now, and it looks that way in a lot of places. And that is one or more less people who are out there and able to answer the phone if someone like Dallas or my dad calls um, or if Adrian calls and says, you know, I saw this new plant and I'm worried it's an invasive. Like, can you come take a look at it? Or, you know, can we do some soil testing because I want to think about how I'm managing this one plot? The extension service is, is just a really critical part of kind of sound conservation program delivery and farm and ranch management. There's also some really important research programs and research initiatives that inform things like rangeland management. And then to your kind of question, right, thinking about rural development, value-added producer grants are things that folks think a lot about, but also there are some really important loan and grant programs there that are more kind of rural business-centered. And sometimes we have to kind of shake it, shake ourselves a little to remember, like, you know, everyone up here on this panel, like Dallas and Adrian, are both rural small business owners. Um, and then USDA has been putting out uh, some announcements, I'm sure that folks in the room and hopefully all the governor's offices are tracking around some of these RFIs, like the request for information around some of the exact issues, like meat and poultry processing, meat and poultry cold storage, right? Like, what are some interesting things? Some of the states have invested some of their COVID response money over the last year and a half trying to pilot some initiatives. Great, what worked, what didn't? What could work better with some different funding? What could work better regionally instead of state specific? I just, the time is now, right? Like there's, there's so much opportunity and to really come in with some lessons learned to say, here are some improvements that could be made in your 2023 farm bill work. And if there's some homework to do between now and then, thinking about how to use state programs, state pilots, state research funding, and then also the annual approach cycle to help get ready for the next farm bill can't disappropriate too much because <laughs> my boss is one. <laughs> I've hocked the mic. Let me, yeah. I'll do him. My name is Kip. I work for the uh, governor of Alaska. Not a ton of ranching, but a uh, question I have for you is related to the conversations we had yesterday. Would, uh, would the uh, ranches that are in this uh, program be considered uh, conservation land, you think, under the 30 by 30 program? And uh, how do you deal with uh, BLM grazing? Is, uh, do you also get to go on to BLM lands and advise them? You want, yeah, I mean, I, I'll sorry. just say one thing. From, um, as Clint Evans mentioned yesterday, I'm east of the Continental Divide. The majority, by far, of land out there is private land. I've never had any experience with any um, public grazing, so I don't know about that. But I, as far as the 30 by 30 goes, my understanding, a uh, ranch such as ours, for example, that was conserved years ago may not be eligible to be included in that, even though that is 
absolutely conserved land. I, I don't know what the parameter is going to be yet. I've heard things both ways that that a piece of property that's already under an easement may not qualify for that. Hopefully somebody else has better information. Do you want me to yeah, 30 you, by 30 and then? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's like, how do you want to divvy, divvy things up here? Um, that's a great question. I think the administration, as I understand it, um, is working on under the construct of America the Beautiful um, is is working on some understandings of, of what could kind of ladder up with that vision of America the Beautiful, kind of thinking through voluntary private land conservation and how that overlays with the public land component. I know, I think it was last week, there were some, there was a panel where BLM and the Forest Service were talking about grazing lands and how some of the grazing permit land may kind of end up laddering up into that America the Beautiful framework. I think it's still, it feels like a lot of those discussions are still ongoing with a real eye to, I, I think, right, kind of this durable conservation question. And that kind of gets at something Dallas talked about, which is, you know, if something's counting or not counting, but the, the question is, is I think for us, right, like this is back to why Audubon is working on ACR in the first place. Like it's so important to, to support durable conservation in the field, like sustainable. And that means it has to be sustainable from financially for producers and also just over a longer arc of time than I think folks necessarily ha always come at a conservation question with. And it feels like that kind of similar question is playing out within America the Beautiful, but um, I guess we will see as that work continues to unfold. Uh, in terms of the, the BLM on grazing lands, uh, that is included in what we do. Uh, we consider any land that's managed through grazing uh, as part of the program. Um, I think what's, interest what's interesting about that, though, is that, you know, at that point, obviously, we're bringing in a lot of different partners. So we're bringing in BLM, NRCS, a lot of different partners <coughs> to help um, really kind of evaluate how that grazing is going. And so, um, you know, I know personally on our own on our own BLM leases, you know, we used to sign a document that was, uh, you know, how many AUMs, and it was kind of assigned to us on what it, what it looked like. And what, it, what we're seeing now, especially within our program that, that we really value is more a movement towards kind of an outcome-based grazing of, you know, how is that being used and, and what does that look like when it's monitored? And so there again, Audubon's able to step in and, and we do some of the monitoring on those public lands to be able to determine really how, how what that grazing is doing and what that, that the overall impacts are. And I think that's one of the things that kind of got lost there a little bit for a while was just the lack of resources to be able to, to monitor some of those public lands on a, on a good scale, on a, on a large enough scale to know what was happening. And so Audubon's pretty happy to be able to step in there and at least, you know, supplement that a little bit. So. I think we've got time for one more, one more? and then we'll okay. cut you all loose. And Thank you, uh, Jim Nyman. Uh, this potentially, from my perspective, could be a game changer, and it's uh, uh, Dustin, you and your group have done a great job. Um, from my perspective, the game changer I'm referring to is I've always had the impression from the timber industry that the Audubon Society, in some cases, has been, and I challenge you farly with this communication issue. <laughs> um, as one of the extreme groups that always was fighting us and signing on to help reduce timber uh, cuts on the forest. Um, I, I really am intrigued by your conservation ranching initiative and I want to check into it more. That's pretty impressive to see that whole change from my perspective of what you guys are doing. Um, the one common thread we all have in the room here, and particularly you and, and Dustin, you and I talked a little bit about that is, and that's water. And that's one of my passions is water. When you recognize that in Colorado and Wyoming, some studies show at least 60% and some show 80% of that water comes off our federal lands from the snowpack that feeds those streams that come down across the arid um, eastern slopes of Colorado and Wyoming. Um, when you look at how important, when I recognize a, a 24 inch ponderosa can drink up to two or 300 gallons a day, uh, if that water's available, and now we have drought, so the tie of us treating those timberlands is so important. I had an opportunity to work with Nature Conservancy 
on the, the east slope of the Bighorns, and their focus was, because uh, I helped chair at the university an uh, open spaces forum at the university, so how do you help protect those ranchers? And part of that was how to get them water down off of those slopes so they had, which ties back into what your passion is, so um, I, I, I'm intrigued to find out more about what Adrian's done being up by the Black Forest and, and the interest there. So, um, Dallas, I appreciate your, your kind words. I, I go back to economics, fundamental economics, and you know, you got new money that we create by ranching. We have a ranch also, and so does forestry do that. The other is old money that you pass on to somebody else, so your comment was meant a lot to me. So I, I challenge you guys to, to discuss a little bit about how do you remarket the Audubon Society with this new initiative to, to get that out. So that misperception that I might have could be shared with others, so thank you. I, all I will say just to start and then I'll jump right in is, is, is I mean, we, we've all made mistakes. We've all, across the board, there, there's been, you know, preconceived notions of what was right and wrong, and, and we're all just trying to, and I think it goes back to what you said, we're all just trying to do the right thing, right? And so now we understand a lot more than we did maybe previously, historically, and, and it's a good thing to have changes in values and a change in mindset based on the this, this science and, and the monitoring that, that we're able to do. And so, uh, Adrian, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of some of the forestry? Just quickly, I know we don't have a ton of time, but I sure. mean, it was important for Audubon. They're on an Audubon ranch, and that, that's something important is to make sure that, that that ranch has a healthy ecosystem that thrives, including the forest. Absolutely, yeah, and so we lease our land from the National Audubon Society we got, um, for the last four years, we've done work with a few different um, timber companies in order to, like I said, kind of clean up from the fire and then so work on all of our black trees and then working to restore kind of that ecological model had Mother Nature been able to burn that ponderosa pine forest as, as much as she would have liked, but our neighbors wouldn't have. <laughs> um, and then recently got some equip funding so that would be another part within the, the farm bill and whatnot um, in order to continue that timber work. Because like you mentioned, or I guess the gentleman with the mic mentioned earlier about the limiting abilities for um, biomass sales and things like that, which makes it that much harder as a rancher who wants to um, improve our ponderosa pine forest and work with timber management companies, but I can't out of pocket pay three thousand dollars an acre for them to to do that work um because there is no market on the the forestry side and so just kind of figuring out how to how to work through all that and then not spray the bejesus out of our place once you have all of that equipment in to do your timber management and so then we use livestock as a tool to um reduce the pressure of uh invasive species or noxious weeds instead of using weed spray so like it's this whole cycle how it how it can all come together and then that makes healthier land and then we grow more beneficial plants which then you know is good forage for our animals then that makes healthier meat and then we eat it like it's just this whole amazing cycle instead of a very straight line on how that works but yeah we've done a, a, a ton of work um, on our place and continue to, uh, we're about to do another 150 acres um, of management on the, uh, the Ponderosa Pine Forest. We've seen the Northern Goshawk come back. Now that we've been able to open up that canopy and, and kind of mimic had there been a lot of small fires over the years instead of just overgrown weak forest that then creates catastrophic forest fires. One more quick thing before we <laughs> yeah. go to Dusty. Aaron said he'd break my arm if I didn't give him the mic. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you go, I promise. Uh, just one quick thought to Jim's point is that uh, in Southwest Colorado, um, working with the San Juan Headwaters Forest Health Partnership, the Wemenuja Audubon Society has been helping us monitor pre and post 
uh, bird populations, and it's been a really great partnership. Uh, we've taken, we've used citizen scientists to get out there on the ground to monitor the populations, and they bring that story back to the community to relate it to the work we're doing on the ground. So, I want to give the Audubon Society props for that, and um, yeah, I think the partnerships that we develop are fantastic. So, thank you. Great. Well, thank you all again for the opportunity to be able to do this. Thank you, panel, for, for coming up and, and standing up here with me and, and answering questions. So um, we really appreciate it, and uh, we're looking forward to the rest of the panels the rest of the afternoon. So thank you. Thank you.